Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Tuesday, August 29th, 2023. President Joe Biden announces the first 10 prescription drugs that will be part of Medicare's price negotiation, including blood thinner, Eliquis, and diabetes treatment Jardians. It's part of last year's Inflation Reduction Act designed to reduce the cost of these drugs for millions of seniors. Coming up, we'll hear from President Biden, also Republican presidential candidate Mike Pence, and talk with Washington Post healthcare reporter Amy Goldstein. AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler ahead of Monday's Labor Day holiday, giving a State of the Union's address and touting that their polling shows two-thirds of Americans support unions. And that rises to near 90 percent for those under age 30. Hurricane Idalia strengthening to a powerful Category 3 on a path to hit Florida's Big Bend, where the Panhandle meets the peninsula on the western side of the state. Governor Ron DeSantis talking about state government preparations and saying, I encourage Floridians to have a plan in place and ensure that their hurricane supply kit is stocked. We'll also hear from the FEMA Administrator, Dean Criswell. Families of the 13 U.S. service members killed in a terrorist attack in the final days of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan two years ago this week testified today before the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee saying there should be high-level accountability in the U.S. government and military. President Biden meets with the president of Costa Rica at the White House, talking about immigration, and Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo continues her trip to China. Article from the New York Times, the Biden administration on Tuesday announced the first 10 medicines that will be subject to price negotiations with Medicare, kicking off a landmark program that is expected to reduce the government's drug spending but is being fought by the pharmaceutical industry in court. Medications on the list are taken by millions of older Americans and cost Medicare billions of dollars annually. The drugs were selected by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services through a process that prioritized medications that account for the highest Medicare spending, have been on the market for years, and do not yet face competition from rivals. That was from the New York Times. Here's President Biden today at the White House. We pay more for prescription drugs than any other major economy in the world, than any other major economy in the world. You can walk into a local drug store across the country, you're paying two to three times more for the exact same prescription manufactured by the exact same company that it would cost you in Canada or France or anywhere else around the world. Think about that. A drug company that makes a drug here in America If it's sold in Chicago, you can buy the same drug in Toronto or Paris cheaper than you can buy it in Toronto. I mean, in in Chicago. And unlike other parts of the healthcare system, Big Pharma got a special carve out that stopped Medicare from negotiating prices of drugs through Medicare. For years, advocates like many of you in this room have worked tirelessly to change that and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription drug prices, just like the Department of Veterans Affairs does right now. It matters. VA pays 50 50 percent less than Medicare can and negotiating the same lower prices. For years, Big Pharma blocked us. They kept prescription drug prices high to increase their profits and extend patents on existing drugs to suppress fair competition instead of innovating. Playing games and pricing so they could charge whatever they can. But this is finally, 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 we had enough votes by a matter of one to beat Big Pharma. Well, we did it. We passed the Inflation Reduction Act with no help from the other team. Every single person on the other team in the Congress voted against it. Every single one. And we're in a situation here where the law finally gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prescription drug prices. And by the way, negotiating drug prices alongside other provisions of this law isn't just going to put more money back in the pockets of millions of Americans across the country. It's also going to lower the federal deficit. According to the Congressional Budget Office, it will save the federal government $160 billion over the next 10 years because Medicare won't be paying less for the prescription drugs they're making available to seniors. President Biden at the White House and more on today's announcement. We're joined on the phone by Amy Goldstein, 
Washington Post health care reporter. Thanks for being with us. At Ten drugs on this initial list. Who chose them and why? Well, good to be with you. Um, these lists were chosen today as kind of a year later sequel to an important part of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a law that was passed by Congress uh, last summer. And that law, for the first time, sets up this idea of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services being able to negotiate directly with the pharmaceutical industry over the prices for some drugs that are sold to people who are on Medicare. So under that law, HHS has a whole process for picking drugs. They need to look at um, which drugs don't have a lot of competition that might drive down prices, um, which drugs um, are uh, the subject of a lot of spending by Medicare, and a few other factors. And then they're ranked. And the top 10 drugs ended up on this list that came out today. Now, these Drugs were chosen in part because you said they don't have competitors. So how will these negotiations work? Well, the negotiations are going to start this fall. I mean, today was sort of the naming of the names. And by October 1st, uh, the manufacturer of each of these 10 drugs has to tell HHS whether it's willing to negotiate or not. If they're not willing to negotiate, there's some costs for that. There are big taxes or the uh, companies can drop out of selling these drugs to Medicare and Medicaid, which would be losing a lot of business. But if they are willing to negotiate, there's a whole sequence of events in which the goal is to get to something called a maximum fair price. And uh, to get there, the companies are supposed to give HHS officials a lot of data And uh, they're supposed to have conversations, and there's going to be some public consultation. And uh, by sometime next year, uh, that price, um, the maximum fair price, is supposed to be set. And then at the beginning of 2026, these lower prices would actually take effect. How much money potentially could be saved by Medicare, and will the savings be passed on to the senior citizens who use that program? Well, there are two um, kinds of savings. One is within the Medicare program itself. And um, in releasing uh, this first list today, um, the Biden administration said that there were about $50 billion, that's be with a boy, $50 billion in spending on these 10 drugs through um, Medicare's drug benefits in the past year. And on top of that, Uh, the out-of-pocket spending by the people on Medicare who took these drugs was about $3.4 billion. So that means that there should be both savings for consumers, older people and disabled people who are on Medicare, and savings for uh, taxpayers and a little reduction in the federal deficit. That's at least the goal. We're talking with Amy Goldstein, Washington Post health care reporter, While this announcement is being made, the pharmaceutical companies are challenging this law in court. What's the status of that, and what what are their arguments? Well, you're right. There are eight lawsuits presently. Uh, There are six uh, cases that have been filed by individual drug manufacturers. The Chamber of Commerce has filed suit, and the main trade group for the pharmaceutical industry also has um, uh, filed a lawsuit. Uh, None of them are very far along. They're spread in many parts of the country. And there are several legal arguments, but the gist is that one way or another, these cases are going to argue that um, these negotiations are unconstitutional. Is it anticipated under the Inflation Reduction Act provision that even more drugs will be added to this list, perhaps all the drugs in the end? Well, not all the drugs, but... um, There's a little increase over the next uh, period of years. So this year, it's 10 drugs. Next year and the year after, it's supposed to be 15 drugs. And, you know, with each of these batches of drugs, um, so this year's batch is supposed to result in lower prices by 2026. Uh, Next year's batch of 15 is going to result, if it all happens and the courts don't block it, in uh, lower prices by 2027 and so on. So eventually, it'll get up to 20 named drugs a year, 
um, for some years after that. Um, but that's not by any chance, by you know, any stretch of the imagination, uh, anywhere close to all the drugs that are um, taken by people on Medicare. And finally, you mentioned that the the lawsuits claim that this law is unconstitutional. The president said this was a no-brainer, should have been implemented a long time ago, but the pharmaceutical companies blocked it. Do you know what their argument was, why they believed that negotiating over their drug prices with Medicare was a bad idea? Well, this is a long-standing political fight. Um, if you go back to 2000. Three, which was when um, a law was passed that added drug benefits um, to Medicare, at least um, ones that people took on their own, not things like you know cancer infusion therapy, but drugs that people took on their own. Um, there was language written into that statute that expressly prohibited direct negotiation between the government um, and uh, these drug companies in Medicare. And that was to get enough Republican votes to pass that law. And the main argument that the pharmaceutical industry has been uh, articulating for many years now is that they need to charge enough prices to subsidize um, their cost of developing uh, uh, new drugs. And if they're charging too little uh, innovation in drug therapy is going to be less. And that's been the heart of, um, of their point of view. Amy Goldstein is a healthcare reporter for The Washington Post. Find her stories at WashingtonPost.com and on X, formerly Twitter, at Goldstein Amy. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And Republican presidential candidate Mike Pence was asked today about the announcement Medicare power to negotiate prescription drug prices and these first 10 drugs named. He was on a teleconference with reporters. Our next question is going to come from David Weigel with Semifer. Your line is open. Thank you. Thank you for doing the call. Uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, the Biden administration today is using these powers uh, created by the IRA last year to uh, directly negotiate due price of prescription drugs. I wondered if uh, that you saw if that is an executive power that you would uh, continue as president or you to repeal and whether you think it's constitutional. Well, I, I, I haven't seen the I haven't seen their proposal. Uh, um, uh, I, I do believe that uh, uh, that uh, that our our, uh, our pharmaceutical community, uh, as we learned uh, during the pandemic, has been a you know an incredible source of, of innovation. Uh, for the American people, and uh, uh, I, I, I would be, I would have concerns about uh, about ultimately, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, being able to use the the uh, power of the government to impose price controls onto the free market. But I again, I haven't looked at their, I haven't looked at the proposal. But I remember many of those discussions, whether it be. Uh, importation or whether it be, um, you know, uh, you know, negotiations of the government in mass with uh, pharmaceutical companies have always been an issue. I'm, I'm someone that would rather see that the cost of uh, medicines uh, be dealt with in, in the marketplace and that us continuing to make it possible for uh, uh, for people that need support in providing uh, uh, their families and having the medicines that they need to get that support instead. Mike Pence, Republican presidential candidate and former vice president, on a teleconference today, taking questions after opening remarks where he laid out his plans for executive orders on his first day as president, if he wins in 2024, in three areas, he says, American security, American workers, and American values. Another Republican presidential candidate, Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, saying today he's suspending his campaign two and a half months after he launched it. He posted, running for president of the United States has been one of the greatest honors of my life throughout this process. I have met so many freedom-loving Americans who care deeply about our nation, her people, and its future. It was a privilege to come so close to appearing on stage with other candidates at last week's first debate. And another Republican 
presidential candidate, former President Donald Trump, posting today that he made the right decision to skip the first Republican presidential debate in Milwaukee last week. He wrote, my poll numbers are up since the very boring, record-setting, low ratings debate. Leading by big numbers, I made the right decision and broke all records with the Tucker Carlson interview. An Emerson College poll shows that Donald Trump dropped six points from 56 percent before the Republican debate to 50 percent after. Nielsen Media Research says 12.8 million people watched that first Republican presidential primary debate. That compares to 20 million who watched the first Republican debate in 2015, the first time that Donald Trump ran for president and was on the stage. This is Washington Today. AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler ahead of Monday's Labor Day holiday at the Labor Federation's headquarters in Washington. She cites new data showing that in 2023, CEOs are making 272 times the salary of an average worker and said she is seeing an awakening of working people uniting to fight what she calls corporate greed. What's different about this Labor Day is the awakening happening all across this country. It's up in Detroit, where just a few days ago, 97% of our UAW members said they were ready to walk off the job and push back against the big three. Ready, ready to, ready to fight for a day once again where good auto jobs build our middle class. It's the Teamsters and the historic contract they just won with UPS. They stood their ground and they won. It's in Starbucks stores all over this country where two years ago we had zero unions and where today we have more than 300. Thank you, Mary Kay Henry. And the courageous Starbucks workers united. It's on the picket line with SAG-AFTRA and the WGA in New York City, LA, Atlanta, Chicago, all over this country. But when I was up in New York City, I saw that everyone could see what was happening with actors and performers and voiceover standing their ground. And then you had taxi drivers honking, you had food delivery workers cheering us on, construction workers chanting right alongside all of us. It's been a long time since this country has seen workers united like this. A long time. We have seen more than 200 strikes so far this year already. And that involves more than 320,000 workers, right? That's 10 times more than even two years ago. Every industry, every red state, every blue state, everything in between. Now, I told you I feel this energy, but obviously I'm the leader of a national labor federation, so I might be a little biased, but Washington is a town that runs on data and polling. So we did our due diligence. We went out and we talked to people all over this country. And I wanna tell you what we found. It isn't just organizers who support unions. It isn't just people on picket lines who support unions. It is the people of the United States who support unions. That's right. You'll see in the data, more than two thirds of people in this country believe in unions. Do you know how hard it is to get two thirds of Americans to agree on anything? Let me put it another way. More Americans believe in unions than like chocolate ice cream and vanilla too, in case you were wondering which was more popular. So a few minutes ago, I mentioned the number 88. I did graduate from high school in 1988. Um, but everyone should leave this room remembering the number 88. Why? Because in our data, 88% of young Americans support unions. AFL-CIO President Liz Schuler giving a State of the Unions address today ahead of Monday's Labor Day holiday. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that union membership fell to 10.1% in 2022, 
and that is down from 10.3% of 2021, and 10.1% is the lowest on record. But a Bloomberg Law article has this, unionization so far this year has hit near historic levels, with more than 58,000 workers driven largely by graduate students and medical interns voting to organize within the last six months. On Wall Street today, the Dow up 292, NASDAQ up 238, S&P up 64. From Forbes, more than half of the country's wetlands could lose federal protections after the Environmental Protection Agency on Tuesday rolled back its definition of federal waters to comply with momentous Supreme Court ruling in May, marking the latest blow to environmental regulations prompted by the high court. The article goes on, the changes follow the Supreme Court's ruling in Sackett v. EPA that determined the Clean Water Act only protects wetlands with a continuous surface connection to federal water bodies, rolling back long-standing protections for tributaries and streams that feed into these bodies of water. From the Orlando Sentinel in Florida, Hurricane Idalia formed Tuesday morning and is already strengthening as it continues into the Gulf of Mexico, where the forecast predicts it will grow into a major Category 3 hurricane before striking Florida's Gulf Coast on Wednesday, according to the National Hurricane Center. Its projected path has the center making landfall in Florida's Big Bend, part of the Gulf Coast, and heading inland between Gainesville and Tallahassee. Forecasters predict it will reach peak sustained winds of 120 miles per hour and gusts up to 150 miles per hour and storm surge that could top 12 feet. That was from the Orlando Sentinel. Governor Ron DeSantis, Republican from Florida this morning at the State Emergency Operations Center in Tallahassee, urging the people of Florida to get ready. This storm is, is, is going to hit uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, you will start certainly seeing effects of this in different parts of the state uh, later on today. Uh, you still have time this morning to be able to make your final preparations. Uh, if you are in one of those areas that's in line for some of the major storm surge and you're told to evacuate, you know, you have time to do that. Uh, but you got you to do that now. You don't have to go hundreds of miles. You can go to a shelter in a different part of your county. Go to a friend's house in an area that is not going to be susceptible to the storm surge. Hotel, all these things uh, are, are, are good to do, uh, and you should do that in heed. Uh, this is going to be a major hurricane, uh, likely a Category 3. And it's where it's uh, scheduled to hit along this big bend, and we've not really had a hurricane strike this area uh, for a long, long time. I think you've got to go back to the 1800s before you would see a path uh, like this. And so, so those coastal areas there, you know, have not necessarily been through this before. And I think that, that, uh, that being safe is, is the appropriate thing and, and erring on the side of caution is the appropriate thing. Uh, we will, of course, be mindful of any changes in the path of this storm. I think everybody on that Gulf Coast from Tampa Bay up until Northwest Florida uh, must remain vigilant. They have nudged the track a little bit further west over the last uh, 24 hours. I mean, we were looking at potentially um, uh, a Levy County, I think yesterday at today. Now we're looking more uh, at a Taylor County. Uh, there's some models that say it may go even even further west. So, so places like Tallahassee, where we are today, certainly uh, you could end up having it uh, hit Tallahassee directly in some of the surrounding areas. So, so everyone just Remain vigilant, continue to watch uh, and listen to the local orders uh, that you receive from your local emergency management personnel. I want to thank everybody. Uh, you know, we've been in contact with you know, people from, from most of these, these counties over the last few days. Everybody's working hard. Everybody understands that, um, that this is a significant event. And uh, you know, they're remaining uh, calm, and cool, and collected, but they're, they're executing. And that's what we need to, to continue to do. I want to thank everybody here at the state of Florida for, for working hard. They've been working uh, now around the clock and, and getting, the, get, getting the resources where they need to be as those requests come in. And of course, once the storm passes, we're going to immediately go uh, to, to commence any type of rescue operations. And, and of course, the power restoration will be a, a big, 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 a big priority. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis at the State Operations Emergency Operations Center in Tallahassee this morning. President Biden on Monday approved an emergency declaration ordering federal assistance to respond to Hurricane Adalia be sent ahead of the storms making landfall. 
The director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Deanne Criswell, spoke to reporters this afternoon at the White House. I did just come from the Oval Office where I briefed the president on the trajectory of Hurricane Idalia and what the impacts are projected to be. And I want to just give a quick update on the preparations that we are making uh, in um, response or in preparation for the response in Florida, as well as other states that are in the path of Hurricane Idalia. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to speak with Governor DeSantis. I also had an opportunity to connect with South Carolina Governor McMaster and Georgia Governor Kemp to help understand um, what their concerns were and to identify any unmet needs that they may foresee. Um, and we'll remain in close contact with all of them in the hours and the days to come as Hurricane Idalia, Idalia makes landfall and moves across these states. Uh, as the president said to Governor DeSantis in his own conversations yesterday, FEMA and the entire federal family are activated to support the people of Florida. The president also quickly approved an emergency declaration in advance of the storm in Florida, turning on the many tools that are available at my disposal to provide the governor any support or resources he may need in advance of landfall and then after. This allows me to pre-stage people, equipment, and resources in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas, and I have done just that. We have pre-positioned uh, different types of resources across all three states to include several incident management assistance teams, our urban search and rescue teams, our disaster survivor assistance teams, and they are all ready to pivot to the most impacted areas immediately after the storm passes. We also have warehouses filled with commodities like food, water, blankets, and medical supplies that are re uh, ready to rapidly move into the impacted area at the state's request. The FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell in the White House briefing room. Another active hurricane, Franklin, was a stronger Category 4, now downgraded to a 3 that's expected to pass west of Bermuda and curve away from the U.S. mainland, although it could create surf and rip currents up and down the East Coast. Washington Today continues in a moment. Congress returns from its summer recess in September with a busy legislative floor schedule ahead. Both the House and Senate are expected to take up federal spending bills, funding the government through next year to prevent a government shutdown. Current government funding expires on September 30th. Lawmakers are also facing end-of-the-month deadlines to reauthorize FAA and pandemic preparedness programs. And the Senate will continue work on more of President Biden's judicial and executive nominations, including for the Federal Reserve. Watch live coverage of the House on C-SPAN, the Senate on C-SPAN 2, and a reminder that you can watch all of our congressional coverage with our free video app C-SPAN Now or online at cspan.org. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcast, and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. A few more headlines. The House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, Republican from Louisiana, says he's been diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which he calls a very treatable blood cancer, and that he's begun treatment and that'll continue for the next several months. He also says, I expect to work through this period and I will tackle this with the same strength and energy as I have tackled past challenges. A lot of well wishes coming from members of Congress, Republican Andy Barr of Kentucky, Posting, please join me in praying for my friend, leader Steve Scalise and his family. Steve is a proven fighter, and I'm confident he will persevere today and every day. We are Team Scalise. And from Troy Carter, Democrat from Louisiana, Steve Scalise will survive this cancer diagnosis like he has conquered all other health challenges thrown in his path. He and his family are in my prayers. From the Associated Press, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett told attendees at a judicial conference in Wisconsin on Monday that she welcomed public scrutiny of the court, but she stopped short of commenting on whether she thinks the court should change how it operates in the face of recent criticism. Justice Barrett did not offer any opinion or speak directly about recent calls for the justices to institute an official code of conduct. That from AP. Two years ago this past Saturday, as the U.S. was withdrawing its forces from Afghanistan, a bomb exploded at the Abbey Gate at Hamid Karzai International Airport in Kabul, killing 13 U.S. service members and at least 170 Afghan civilians. Today, relatives of the 13 U.S. service members who died, Gold Star families, spoke at a U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee roundtable in Washington, D.C. 
Darren Hoover, father of Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Darren Taylor Hoover, said there are still unanswered questions about why security was lax that day. We want answers. We need answers. And we expect those answers. I'm calling on you, please, please, don't let this fall through the cracks. You haven't thus far and have made us proud. Please continue it. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk a lot, but I am going to breathe a little bit of fire. I want to know why this current administration isn't able to take responsibility for their actions in the days, the weeks, and the months leading up to this fatal, fateful day. Not a single thing was set in stone since the withdrawal date had been pushed back. If this timetable had been pushed back a couple of months, why was the evacuation time so truncated and on a specific timeline? On or about August 18, 2021, General Milley stated this, there was nothing that I or anyone else saw that indicated a collapse of the Afghan army or this government in 11 days. How is that not possible? Secretary Austin stated, we'll evacuate all Americans that we can at least until the clock runs out or our capabilities are overextended. What in the world does that mean? What does that mean before the clock runs out? Were there not contingency plans upon contingency plans upon contingency plans executed made ready in case one plan fell through and another one had to be taken into place. As Chairman McCall said, failure to plan is planning to fail. I've talked a couple of times with some special operators from in theater that were there at the time and leading up to that fateful day. They tell the story a little bit differently. There was a plan set in place before the previous administration had left. It was not planned by suits. It was planned by boots. And they were training for it, training for it, and training for it. They had it down. They had the contingency plans set in place. This administration walks in and blows it to kingdom come. Ignorance? To me it is. Complete ignorance. Darren Hoover is father of the late Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Darren Taylor Hoover, speaking today in Washington at a meeting of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, along with other families of the 12 other U.S. service members who died in the terrorist bombing outside the Kabul airport two years ago during the U.S. US withdrawal from Afghanistan. Darren Hoover calling for the resignations of President Biden, General Mark Milley, Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. During this hearing, General Milley releasing a statement which was read by the committee chair, Republican Congressman Michael McCall of Texas, and that statement reads in part, we owe Gold Star families everything. We owe them transparency. We owe them honesty. We owe them accountability. We owe them the truth about what happened to their loved ones. I trust the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps did the best they could in briefing the families who had loved ones killed at Abbey Gate. I believe the briefers gave every piece of information that they could. If there were issues with that, we needed to take whatever corrective action is necessary. That part of the statement from General Milley. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary, Sabrina Singh, was asked at her news conference today at the Pentagon 
about criticism from Congressman McCall. There's a hearing going on right now with um, Gold Star families from the Abbey Gate bombing, and at the beginning of the hearing, Congressman McCall, chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, said two years later, we're still here seeking answers. How did this happen? What went wrong? Why couldn't this tragedy have been prevented? These questions remain unanswered because this administration wants to sweep what happened under the rug. They know they bear the brunt of the blame and they want to escape any accountability. Do you care to respond to that? Well, I haven't seen the comments that were made, as, as I think you mentioned that this is ongoing right now. But um, first, let me say that uh, the secretary and others in this department have um, expressed their incredible um, they're incredibly grateful for the service and sacrifice that our, our service members have made um, in Afghanistan and, and those who were committed to the evacuation operations. Um, in terms of responding to some of the comments that were made, I think you know that CENTCOM conducted a very comprehensive, credible, and definitive investigation into the Abbey Gate bombing following the attack. Um, our U.S. military commanders on the ground made the best decisions that they could, uh, that they were provided um, with of the, of the um, uh, intelligence and the evidence that they were given on the ground to, uh, that they were able to make those decisions in, in I'm sorry, let me just take a step back because I realize I'm sort of jumbling my words here. U.S. military commanders on the ground in Afghanistan made, the, made decisions that they could with the information that they had at the time. Um, they were fully given, um, uh, they, they were given the decision-making capability and were responding to threats on the ground in real time. And so we are very proud of the work that our commanders and our service members did, not during just the evacuation in those um, few weeks, but over the 20-year war. Um, and I think, as you probably know, that we also did uh, a very um, deep investigative AAR that we submitted to Congress that also provided um, uh, members of the SASC and, and Haas Committee with our findings of um, not just the um, evacuation, but just our t larger takeaways from Afghanistan. And I'll leave it at that. The Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh with reporters at the Pentagon today. A Scripps News article reads that a bipartisan Afghanistan War Commission continues its multi-year look into what went wrong. And the White House earlier this year posted a 12-page review about the Afghanistan withdrawal on its website in which it placed some blame on the Trump administration for allowing the Taliban to be so organized. Sabrina Singh also asked today about this past weekend's deadly crash of a Marine V-22 Osprey tilt rotor aircraft during a training exercise in Australia. Three Marines were killed and 20 others were wounded. Starting last year, both the Air Force and the Marine Corps acknowledged that the Osprey has this uh, rare but persistent issue with its clutch. Does the DOD, is the DOD concerned about this engineering fault, which the Marines admit doesn't have a permanent solution yet, as far as just the platform itself is concerned broadly? Well, in terms of the, um, the incident that happened over this past weekend, again, that's still under investigation. So I don't want to jump ahead or, or get to... Um, jump to any conclusions that haven't been reached yet. As I mentioned to Laura, each incident undergoes its own investigation. I wouldn't right now apply um, a, a sweeping broad stroke across every incident linking them together. Um, they're all very unfortunate. They, you know, every time this happens, of course, uh, we are, we always think about the service members who um, are putting their lives at risk, but I wouldn't say that um, they're all connected in, in one way or the other. Does the Pentagon have confidence in the Osprey as, a, as an airframe? <clears throat> I, I think we, we do certainly have confidence in the Osprey. Um, if anything changes, if these investigations lead to something that would uh, cause us or a service to adjust um, anything about how we believe the Osprey should be used, we would do that. But at this time, we have confidence in that. Pentagon Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh at her news conference. CNN posting what it calls an exclusive story today that reads the FBI is investigating more than a dozen Uzbek nationals allowed into the U.S. after they sought asylum at the southern border with Mexico earlier this year. A scramble set off when in U.S. intelligence officials found that the migrants traveled with the help of a smuggler with ties to ISIS, according to multiple U.S. officials. 
While the FBI says no specific ISIS plot has been identified, officials are still working to identify and assess all of the individuals who gained entry to the United States, according to a statement from the National Security Council spokesman Adrian Watson. And they are closely scrutinizing a number of the migrants as possible criminal threats, according to two U.S. officials. This came up today at the White House briefing with Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. How is it possible that an ISIS sympathizer is sneaking people into this country? So just so that uh, folks, I'm assuming you're speaking to the CNN uh, story, right? Okay, so I just want to make sure that uh, uh, folks who are watching understand the question. So I just want to be really clear here. So the intelligence alerted us to a human smuggling network. Uh, we moved fast uh, and, and successfully to, uh, to uh, successfully to disrupt it. So just want to be very clear of that. And we well, are being you, you disrupted it. Are you saying that you know where all of the people this ISIS sympathizer snuck into the country are? If I can answer the question, I'm sure I'll touch on every everything that you want to ask me. So again, in, intelligence alerted us of this human human uh, smuggling network. We believe and we move fastly and we successfully disrupted it. So let's be very clear about that. And we are grateful. We are very grateful to the law enforcement for their quick work and their vigilance on this. Now, to your other part of the question, smugglers have been detained overseas, including one linked to the foreign terrorist uh, organization. Uh, no sign, there is no sign that any, anyone moved by the smuggling network has terrorism connections, so I want to be clear there as well. And what we were able to do as precaution, uh, people brought here by smuggling network are being subject to extra vetting and are all in removal proceeding. And in addition to that, in addition to that, anyone coming across the border outside of the network uh, who matches the profile of those in the smuggling network is subject to uh, extra vetting, detained, and put in expedited removal uh, proceedings as well. You said that there's no sign of a plot, but isn't it true that the U.S. has to be right with preventing terrorist attacks 100 percent of the time? They only have to be right once. So let's be very clear. I want to be really clear here. We are committed. This is, this is a White House that is committed to making sure that we are protecting our homeland and also protecting the American people. That is our commitment. We will continue to be vigilant on that. And so want to be uh, incredibly clear uh, on this. And, uh, and, and we are thankful. We are grateful for our law enforcement who, uh, who acted very quickly here. And they are disrupted. They, dis they successfully disrupted uh, the smuggling network. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre being questioned by Peter Ducey, White House correspondent for Fox News, at today's briefing. Immigration also coming up as President Biden meeting today with the President of Costa Rica, Rodrigo Chavez, in the White House Oval Office. AP writes that in recent years, Costa Rica, with a population of 5 million, has become one of the world's leading spots for asylum requests. In June, Costa Rica and the U.S. agreed to open potential legal pathways to the United States for some of the Nicaraguan and Venezuelan migrants who are among the 240,000 asylum seekers in the Central American nation. That from AP, here's President Biden and the Costa Rican president at the White House. Well, Mr. President, it's uh, great to welcome you back to the White House. Great to be by your side again. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, just over a year ago in California, we stood together with partners across the region for the Los Angeles Declaration on Migration and Protection. You've done an incredible job since then. You've been a great partner. I want to thank you um, for the, uh, to make that declaration possible and for your leadership on the migration challenges that, uh, that we face every single day. But today, I also want to thank you for deepening uh, our security cooperation. That's one of my objectives today, and I hope yours including uh, dealing with organized crime. And as we discuss our work through the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, help grow our economy from the bottom up and the middle out, not just the top down. And, uh, because our nation is not only united by the challenges we face, but we're not, what I've found with you, Mr. President, is we're united by the vision we share, by the vision we share a vision for a future of greater opportunity and freedom and equality, and quite frankly, dignity, dignity for all our people. So, Mr. President, thank you again for being here. Looking forward to our conversation today. We've got lots to talk about, and uh, I think things are getting nothing but better. 
May I, Mr. President? Please. Thank you very much, uh, President Biden, for the people of Costa Rica. It's a great honor to be discussing with the leader of the United States of America. Uh, I agree fully with your vision, the vision of the people of this great country, where prosperity should be shared widely, generated and shared widely, and that we have challenges to the generation of, of that prosperity and the quality of life of our people, including security. And the moves that the United States is making to make the supply chains safe, to keep your economic prosperity uh, going uninterrupted by other outside events, I think is something that Costa Rica is proud to be part of. Thank you for being making us part of the CHIPS Act arrangements. And I can affirm you, Mr. President, that Costa Rica has been and shall remain one of the strongest allies in the world regarding your economic and security interests that are our own. So it's a great pleasure to be here, sir. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. President, your message to people in Florida about the hurricane, the hurricane in Florida, Mr. President? Thank you. I spoke with the governor last night. We're providing everything that he possibly needs. We're in constant contact. I had the director of FEMA in here today earlier talking about it. It's, uh, it's going to be, uh, I think we're worried about the, the surge, the ocean surge. We don't know exactly yet. It's hour to hour we're watching this. And, uh, but I told the governor that, uh, and the mayor, uh, and the regions that are likely to be hit first, that we're there as long as it takes. We're going to make sure they have everything they need. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you, guys. Mr. President. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President. Mr. President. President Biden in the White House Oval Office with the President of Costa Rica, Rodrigo Chavez, is the first bilateral meeting between the two leaders and the first time a President of Costa Rica has met with American President in the Oval Office in 17 years. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is continuing her visit to China. A Washington Examiner article says that she arrived Sunday in Beijing on a dual mission to defend U.S. restrictions on China's access to sensitive technology, such as advanced semiconductors and the equipment to manufacture them, while also touting opportunities for symbiotic economic relationships in low-risk areas. Yet her visit is taking place just months after a corporate survey showed a surge in American aversion to doing business under the communist regime. On Monday, after meeting with her Chinese counterpart, she spoke at the U.S. mission in Beijing. First, we agreed to establish a new commercial issues working group, a formal working group, which will involve U.S. and Chinese government officials, and very importantly, U.S. and Chinese commercial private sector representatives as we seek solutions on trade and investment issues and to advance U.S. commercial interests in China. So to the 100 plus businesses with whom I spoke, I'm happy to say we're delivering. We will have that formal communication. Second, we agreed to launch an export control enforcement information exchange that will serve as a platform, we hope, to reduce misunderstandings of U.S. national security policies. Uh, the United States is committed to being transparent about our export control enforcement strategy. Now, I want to be clear. We are not compromising or negotiating in matters of national security, period. But this is meant to be a dialogue where we increase transparency and where we are clear about what we are doing as it relates to export control enforcement. And by the way, uh, to show you how real this is, the first meeting of that new information exchange is tomorrow in Beijing. We're wasting no time. Uh, we also agreed to convene subject matter experts from both sides to hold technical discussions regarding strengthening the protection of trade secrets and confidential business information. Every business person I spoke with in preparation for this trip 
uh, and those of you who, to whom I've spoken today has said IP protection and trade secret protection is paramount and so I'm very pleased that Minister Wong and I agreed to have these technical discussions. And then finally, and I think just as important, the Minister and I agreed to communicate regularly, formally and informally, at our level, at the Secretary and Minister level, about commercial and economic issues, and we agreed to meet in person at least annually. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo in Beijing, China on Monday, and her meetings today included China's number two leader, Premier Li Kang. Associated Press reports that she rebuffed an appeal Tuesday by Chinese leaders to reduce U.S. export controls on technology with possible military uses, but the two governments agreed to have experts meet to discuss disputes over protecting trade secrets. Also this from the Associated Press article, Secretary Raimondo joined a series of American officials, including Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who have visited Beijing in the past three months. They're trying to restore relations that are at their lowest level in decades due to disputes of technology, security, Taiwan, and other issues. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word, and you'll get the stories Washington is talking about emailed to you every day. Subscribe at c-span.org slash connect.